Well, uh, I'm Jim Surkamp, and uh, this is Dennis Fry, whose name is synonymous with the Maryland campaign. Uh, if you notice my copy of Dennis's new book, uh, Antietam's Shadows, seems well worn. Mine's not as worn. <laughs> he, he didn't have to read it, he wrote it. But uh, let's just start this way. This is a really, really impressive, really neat book because it, it really wants to get to the bottom of things. That's my impression. Um, so we'll just start this way. Uh, Dennis, you, there's been a, the story of the Maryland campaign has been cemented into one perception that started with Francis Palfrey in the late 19th century's book. James Murfin wrote The Gleam of Bayonets in 1965. And Stephen Sears, the big one, Landscape Turned Red. They all have nurtured us, <laughs> taught us, convinced us that the real message of the Battle of Antietam was that McClellan blew an opportunity to end the war because he was slow and specifically he wasted 18 hours after finding the contents of the Lost Order of Lee's uh, written by Robert E. Lee. So we've all learned that. We've all been taught that. Genuflected at the altar of. And you're saying no. You're saying that is not only a distortion, it's just not founded in fact. So, and I'll just simply, what my, the biggest impression is that, and you're making it very clear, McClellan had plenty of his foibles, they're, they're well known, and he sure wished he burned all his letters to his wife, but you make it clear, and I never knew this, that Lee was really positioned to go further west. He was in Hagerstown, which I didn't know, and he was positioning, to go, he really was planning to get into Pennsylvania and cause a headache for uh, Lincoln during the elections. Something I never knew was you're saying that he sh you show the McClellan, uh, we can say, vexed Robert E. Lee's extreme left flank on the 16th, the, the night before the battle, and cut him off, and just basically that was the end of any attempt to move into P uh, Pennsylvania by first going west in Maryland. Uh, can we just start there? Am I, am, did, I, did I read it all wrong, or am I right, or what? I'm very interested. Well, thank you, Jim, uh, for the opportunity to discuss the book. I know you've read it. It is, it is well used and well worn, and uh, uh, I really appreciate you diving deeply into it. Um, first of all, let me, let me put this in context, because I think context is really important. Um, I don't like George McClellan. Uh, I've spent over four decades <laughs> bashing George McClellan. I have a reputation of being anti-McClellan. And so anyone who reads this book and says, well, he's flipped, uh, he's completely changed, or he's gone crazy, uh, doesn't understand what I'm really doing. This is not a treatise on McClellan that is a pro-McClellan book. What I've done is, and I think what every good historian must do, is constantly evaluate position constantly ask themselves, is this right? Is this correct? Do I really believe this? What is the evidence that I've been using to back this up? And challenge oneself. Constantly ask oneself uh, to evolve and not be afraid to change position. So this book, in many respects, I changed position. 
Um, and I do that not because I've suddenly had some uh, love fest with George McClellan, but because I've discovered evidence that's counter to what I previously believed and what I previously preached. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to ignore the evidence. Uh, I'm not going to throw it away and say, how can I not accept this? I've been wrong. So have so many others. And so the whole premise of the book is don't be afraid to challenge a historian. Historians very much pick and choose what facts they wish to present or what stories they wish to tell. Every piece of history is prejudiced by the historian. With a narrative, seeking a narrative. And so there's a lot of prejudice and ill will against McClellan. And so the three authors that you mentioned, Francis Palfrey, writing in the 1880s, James Murphin, whose book Leave of Bayonets was published okay. during the centennial, mm -hmm. and then Stephen Sears, whose book came out in the early 1980s, all share what I call the firm. I refer to it in the book as the firm. <laughs> Palfrey, Murphin, and Sears, the firm. And the perspective of the firm, the opinion, and this is very important, the opinion of the firm is that McClellan screwed up time and again. It's a hackneyed version of George McClellan, always delayed, never moving, even having information presented to him that he does not make good use of. And as a result, he doesn't end the war. He doesn't truly win the Battle of Antietam. Um, he doesn't destroy Lee. The, this is the position of the firm. And that's the position of the typical American public, that McClellan was an absolute failure. McClellan had failings, but I argue in the book that so many of the failures that he's presented as uh, are not actual. Well, so that's, that's where, um, what, what are some real examples of that? I mean, I, I followed up what your, your citations were in there, and one big note thing I noticed was how Lee and Stewart were very unequivocal at how fast the response was, and related I'm going to add to that, do you think there's a lot of carryover perceptions of McClellan at the peninsula and earlier events which were used, misapplied to Antietam? He had, his, he had his mistakes at the Maryland campaign, but his persona favored him. You know, there was this carryover perception. What are your comments on that? I don't, I don't think there's any doubt. Uh, I, your perception is correct. McClellan has a... Um, McClellan does not perform well in the Peninsula campaign. Um, McClellan is very slow and very deliberate and very methodical. And of course, the numbers game where he, uh, he uh, postulates that the enemy numbers are greater than his own and that he's always outnumbered and he's always demanding reinforcements. This is the persona of George McClellan that we're so much so familiar with. That's been applied, every one of those aspects of his persona has been applied to the Maryland campaign, which came after the Peninsula campaign. Well, that is not fair. Um, and it's actually not accurate uh, because he performs differently, um, much, much differently in the Maryland campaign than he did in his approach to Richmond a few months earlier. And so this idea that the, Pinella, the McClellan of the Peninsula campaign is the same McClellan as the Maryland campaign is false narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not true. You know, so, so we're talking about this carryover. And of course, Lee was starting to look, uh, you know, he was enjoying the great uh, Lee Jet Stonewall detente.
and was having a string of victories, and they were looking invincible. And so in the, the immediate backdrop was bumbling by the federal commanders and Lee and Jackson at their best. Well, and Lee and Jackson were at their best, mm -hmm. absolutely at their best. Uh, this represents the, uh, perhaps the zenith of Lee and Jackson. Now, now, many historians would argue that the zenith of Lee and Jackson are Chancellorsville. But that's, I think that's, uh, again, a false uh, narrative. Uh, Lee Jackson does not succeed at Chancellorsville. He does not break the federal right. He never broke through. That's the reason he was out reconnoitering that night, is he was trying to figure out, where can I break them? So although they did flee and run uh, with the original surprise on the attack of May 2nd, the federal right uh, regrouped and stands and doesn't completely break. And so Jackson has partial victory. But here in the, in the uh, Maryland campaign, uh, where, where we see them working so closely together, and in the second Manassas came, the campaign is a prelude to the first invasion, that is, that, that is Lee and Jackson together at their best. And uh, Jackson, of course, will have great success at Harper's Ferry in this campaign and a very, very difficult assignment, extremely difficult mission. Um, and then uh, fighting in Antietam, their tactical performance is brilliant at Sharpsburg. Um, um, no question about it. But um, the opinion, the impression of the Federals is that there's chaos, there's confusion, there's consternation, there's nobody in charge, there's little control. Um, and it's not just in the Federal armies, but that's the, that's the United States political situation mm -hmm. uh, at this time. Um, the Lincoln administration appears with this invasion when Lee comes across the Potomac River and challenges the United States directly, boldly, uh, forcibly, says, here I am, I dare you to stop me. Um, it makes the Lincoln administration and the Republican Congress look absolutely imbecilic, incompetent. Uh, President Lincoln had promised that the war would be over in 90 days. Oh. President Davis his counterpart, the Confederate president, and also promised the war would be over in 90 days. We all know how good politicians are at predicting how long a war will last. <laughs> and so they're both wrong. So now we're entering our 17th month, and we've killed uh, over 200,000 people either through bullets or disease. We've maimed hundreds of thousands of others. Uh, the most famous song in the United States in September of 1862 is The Vacant Chair. Didn't know. The vacant chair, uh, because, uh, and it was a beautiful song. It's a it's a song that that just pulls your heart. Um, but obviously, there were many dinner tables where there was a chair vacant, uh, and that chair would never be filled again because of the immense number of casualties that had occurred. And so, the Lincoln administration just doesn't look competent. It doesn't appear that the end of the war is anywhere in sight. And this is one reason for Lee's invasion. Lee wants to take advantage not only of the chaos in the Union armies, and, there, and there's nobody in charge, there's no commander at the time uh, that Lee invades, uh, but he also wants to um, exploit the political uh, situation and the uh, Lincoln's failure to bring an end to a war that seems to now be endless.
isn't it interesting that this is the first of three times there was a serious Confederate incursion into Pennsylvania. And we know that uh, the first one, this one, and then actually the third was in 64, which is Jubal Early in Chambersburg and Monocacy. But they, they were so uh, uh, tied with the election results. And, um, well, especially in 62 yeah, and it was 64. very conscious. I mean, there's no question that uh, General Lee, every day that there were Confederates north of the Potomac River, our votes against Lincoln and Republicans. More so, General Lee's objective, his, his, his principal goal for his army in September 1862 never was Maryland. Maryland was a state he intended to pass through, not fight in. His, his, his goal was Pennsylvania. He intended to take the army north of the Mason-Dixon line because Pennsylvania is the real, where the invasion really begins, not Maryland. I mean, not Maryland. I mean, Pennsylvania is Yankee country. That's the northern state, and that's where they're going. Did, did Lee have a, a written plan to Davis where he says, my goal is to go to Pennsylvania? Yes. In fact, he actually sends a uh, note to the president in which he says um, that he intends to take the army into Pennsylvania unless the president, his president, President Davis, objects. There was no objection. Mm -hmm. And so not only were Lee and Davis on the same page, but Confederate press, the Confederate press and the Confederate Congress all supported this. There's a resolution in the Confederate Congress that applauds Lee for the invasion, supports the invasion, not as an occupation, that was not its purpose, but as a, an invasion into Northern Territory to sway the political... Congressional elections. That's exactly right, to sway the Congressional elections of 1862. We must understand that the Republican hold on the Congress in, in the fall of 1862, a very slim majority. The other thing we need to understand is that that this is the first election in American history where the con where the, the Republicans are trying to defend their congressional majority, their majority in the House. That's never happened before. The first election that the Republican Party took control of the House of Representatives as a majority party was in 1860. So this is the very first time that many of those Republicans are up for re-election, and it has not been a good two years. You know. What you're saying, it, uh, it, it, the more I listen, the more you feel that when someone says Antietam and Maryland campaign, it has been so grossly distorted into this one narrative, and everything we're describing is, a, is an overlooked narrative that we're going to go into Pennsylvania and, and affect an election. Uh, you know, the, the, the dominant impression is they went to Maryland and got and could have been beaten altogether. But this whole thing about trying to get to Pennsylvania is, is is massively supported and endorsed in the South, but you don't read that. And and McClellan saw it and did something to stop it. But that's the whole story that seems to have been uh, sheared off from the story. Well, and that's what is, is that correct? It is. It has been sheared off. It's been ignored, and it hasn't been told. Now there's a reason for that. History didn't happen like that. That was not the actual historical record. And so historians typically only provide you the actuality, the historical record. I like to go beyond that. Um, there's a great disadvantage in history, and I talk about this in Antietam Shadows. The great disadvantage is that you and I know the end of the story. <laughs> right. We know how the story finishes. I use an analogy that it's like watching the Super Bowl, and then you, but you're not there to watch it. You've been called away. You can't watch it. So you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on the DVR. I'm going to tape it. And you're driving somewhere. You have the radio on. And all of a sudden, the score, the final score of the Super Bowl comes on. And you say, oh, no. That, you just ruined everything. I didn't get a chance to see the game. There's no surprise. I now know how it ends. Well, you, you completely deflate when you know the 
the end of the story. It's like starting at the end of the movie, watching the end of the movie first, and then going back to the beginning and watching how you got to the end. That's how history is presented. We always know the end of the story. Yeah. So as a result, because the end did not include Pennsylvania, Lee didn't make it, uh, that it, it oh, doesn't right. talk about Lee getting into Pennsylvania because he doesn't arrive there, he stopped. We never speak about things that. That's that not part of the story. The it didn't, didn't happen, work. it didn't work. I like to focus on as much of what didn't occur as what does occur because history is not a single line. It's not a single arrow. Um, there's all of this that's happening in the context of the actual historical moment and I like to bring in all that extra context mm -hmm. so that we can get a better understanding of what was happening for them at the moment, at the time, at, rather than as they, saw it. as they saw it and as they were experiencing it rather than us reflecting back on it and having this myopic focus on only the actuality. So what I'm hearing is when we're trying to fashion a true context, what we seem to have to do is peel off all of the uh, lionizing or, or excoriating of individuals and you have to peel off all of the, the biases of the victor maybe, but you know the outcome. And for example, what I'm getting at is, is I don't know, was it Harsh, Joseph Harsh? Lee was making desperate decisions under desperate circumstances and actually even McClellan was. You know, of course he put a nice face on in his report later, but, but that's what the, the, is often overlooked. They were, they're working on the fly at the moment, and as you said in your book, Lee got it, Lee asked Jackson to do the impossible, to go all that 50 miles over two mountain ranges. He, by that time, Jackson was invincible to him, but the point is, that was a mistake. It fortunately didn't hurt that much. Well, we can look at errors that General Lee makes, and he certainly makes errors in this campaign. And there's been some focus on mistakes that Lee has made. But where there has not been attention is where did McClellan stop him? McClellan has gotten no credit for stopping Lee. If this isn't one-sided, Lee doesn't Lee doesn't make it into Pennsylvania because Robert E. Lee makes a mistake. He doesn't get into Pennsylvania because George McClellan stops him. Well, a that's successful action. Right? That's a story that is never told because McClellan can have no successes, at least not based upon the firm, Palfrey, Murphy, and Sears. You can have no successes if you're George McClellan. But McClellan stops Lee not just once, not just twice, not thrice, but, and I would argue, four different times, McClellan is very, very successful in stopping Lee's initiative. 